Great. I would like to go ahead and thank everyone for taking the time to join us for today's webinar focused on best practices in emergency center operations for public safety organizations and enterprises. My name is Chris Cooper and I work for Cinemassive, a company headquartered in Atlanta, and we've been designing and deploying advanced video wall solutions for command and control rooms since 2005. Before we get started, please note that you can submit any questions you have by clicking on the question mark in the chat box on the lower right of your screen, and we'll cover all of them at the end of the presentation. In addition, we will be sending a link to this recorded webinar to everyone who registered. Tom Polivka, our Vice President of Sales, will kick us off with a short presentation. We will then hear from the City of Chesapeake as they tell us about their Public Safety Operations Center before Dustin Bilthaus, our Public Safety Account Executive for North America, walks us through a demonstration highlighting how customers are using Cinenet for emergency response. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn the webinar over to Tom to get us started. Thanks, Chris. And thanks again to all of you for taking the time to hear about the evolution of a new breed of emergency operations center that can support response to multiple converging incidents. After I provide a short introduction here, I'll introduce one of our most forward-thinking clients, the city of Chesapeake, Virginia, who will share some relevant EOC lessons with us. We'll finish with a demonstration so you can see some of the future features and concepts firsthand. I'd like to start by offering a quick overview of our qualifications for those of you not familiar with Cinemassive. First of all, we've designed and deployed over 800 systems worldwide. Some of these are single room projects, but many efforts entail repeat deployments for global enterprises. Along the way, we've created the broadest array of command center environments, from security and network operation centers to utility control centers, and of course, emergency operation centers. We've deployed miniaturized ruggedized technology to support mobile command centers for first responders and warfighters in the field. We've also supported arena-sized watch floors with hundreds of panels. Learning about how operators act and react in the command center environment has informed our product lifecycle and given rise to innovations, such as ones we'll be discussing here that are relevant to EOCs. If you registered for this webinar, you likely know something about why emergency operation centers are deployed, but EOCs come in a variety of shapes and sizes. As the concept of the EOC evolved over the years and we were called on to help replace and modernize legacy facilities, we saw everything from small closets with a handful of servers and terminals to larger conference rooms where managers huddle to receive updates and status from small video walls with semi-fixed layouts. We've also seen real-time crime centers and other control room venues repurposed during periods of disaster response. Finally, with more municipalities availing themselves of DHS grants and of course, recently available CARES funding, we're seeing a significant upturn in dedicated EOCs, such as the one established by our friends in Chesapeake. The ideal model we envision for the modern command center is one that provides decision makers a 360 degree view of incident response. At Cinemassive, we borrowed a term from our military partners to describe this advantage. We call it the global common operating picture. And we'll talk about it throughout our discussion today. As we approach a myriad of weather related response scenarios from tropical storms in the east to wildfires in the west, continued COVID inter intervention introduces new challenges competes for resources, and broadens the common operating picture. Let's rethink the scenario that arises from multi-crisis response. To assess the capacity of modern EOCs to adapt, we'll present a handful of key challenges and show how Cinemassive meets these from a proactive and a reactive standpoint. During these difficult times, EOCs must be multi-function hubs for reacting to coinciding crises. Real-time crime centers, 911 dispatch, traffic control are all contributing to cooperative incident response. In testing EOCs for required flexibility, we ask questions like, can a non-technical user create a new layout in minutes? Can all of the layout and behavior changes be accomplished without programming? Are all your devices controllable directly from the same place? And can a novice user learn to operate the wall in under an hour? Both the city of Chesapeake and Dustin will explain and demonstrate how our simplified Cinenet user interface effectively supports the dynamic EOC model. Larger stationary command centers are table stakes for emergency operations, but the EOC of the future must extend command and control to first responders in the field. A little later, Dustin will show you how our ruggedized strike unit provides a portable command center in a 12 pound package about the size of a large shoebox. With the ability to process 16 high definition inputs and outputs, Strike can be set up and fully operation, operational in under 15 minutes, 
and can also stream its local view to a headquarters ESC or other video wall. The traditional command center model of sequestering up to dozens of operators in a purpose-built environment flies in the face of social distancing guidelines. Working with DOD commanders in the field, Cinemassive realized early on that command and control strategies could not assume that all decision makers were in the same room. As a result, we developed various methods for sharing and viewing video wall information from outside the command center that are compliant with COVID related restrictions. When you watch Dustin's demo, please be aware that everything he is doing to control or view the wall is being accomplished from the comfort of his home office. Because URLs URL-based sources such as those providing geospatial awareness or social monitoring dedicate a compute resource to each stream. Operator desktops are often co-opted for website access. In extreme cases, entire racks are deployed to house single purpose servers. Heavy GPU loads also choke EOC processors, which become unstable over time and have to be replaced. To deal with this situation, Cinemassive has developed an appliance called CineAgent that is powerful, compact, and delivers the firepower to process up to four URL streams simultaneously. It's half the size of an average blade, costs less, and has almost no maintenance footprint. It also allows operators to effectively interact, not just view websites. Dustin will demonstrate a number of distinct Cine agent advantages in the EOC. Recapping our EOC of the future vision and the global common operating picture it provides, we want to demonstrate how day-to-day -day EOC access and operations can be moved offsite to accommodate the new restrictions around social distancing. Of course, we want to accomplish this without impacting decision-making by key staff that aren't in the facility. And we have to assume that first responders and other frontline operators may be using mobile command systems to stream content back to one or more stationary walls. Finally, it's important in emergency operations to support coalitions that span state and local, as well as federal agencies. I've briefly outlined some of the EOC features we deem critical. In our next two segments, you'll actually see these concepts in action. Now I'm excited to transition to our friends at the city of Chesapeake, who manage one of the most advanced EOCs in the country. Rob Braidwood and Bobby Jellermine will relate firsthand the challenges of handling converging response across a major coastal region. So I'm Rob Braidwood, uh, City of Chesapeake uh, Emergency Manager. Um, the City of Chesapeake is a large uh, city in the Hampton Roads area of uh, Tidewater, Virginia, Hampton Roads, Virginia. Uh, we have about 275,000 citizens. Uh, our land area is enormous. It's 355 square miles. So it's more of like a county than it is really a city. Um, we have a large plethora of hazards in this in our uh, hazard suite in the city of Chesapeake from flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, terrorism, and hazardous materials uh, incidents. Um, when we set out to design the PSOC, the Public Safety Operations Center, uh, we were uh, previously operating in basically a classroom environment uh, that was about uh, 300 square feet, and we were grossly under, under uh, uh, served by that room. So we now have built a $50 million building. Uh, we have about 4,000 square feet in EOC operations alone. We have several breakout rooms around the EOC floor uh, that enable us to bring in the proper number of people to operate uh, during a disaster for the city of our size. When we approached um, a video wall for our EOC, we looked at several different vendors and Cinemassive uh, came back as the number one vendor for us due to the ease of use, the information sharing capabilities of the wall uh, into different breakout rooms so that we could bring stuff from breakout rooms into the main wall and vice versa. Uh, and it was easily the best uh, solution for us um, for that video sharing capability and the information data sharing capabilities. Um, <clears throat> because we have so many different departments in here working at the same time um, uh, throughout the city. We also have federal partners in here. We also have state partners in here, port partners, and private sector partners, uh, along with education, too. So we needed a tool that could be able to share uh, information easily amongst those different stakeholder groups. So obviously, before COVID, in an EOC environment, 
The idea is you bring everybody into a room, you cram everybody into a, a room, uh, close quarters, and we all make decisions together. So that is how this room was designed. That's probably how every emergency operations center or operations center 911 center is designed, is to bring everybody into a, a one space and operate through uh, collaboration uh, and visu visually seeing the same data on a, a big video wall. Uh, and saying, hey, how are we going to evacuate this area or whatever it is? And so we, that's how we operated before COVID. Now that we have um, CDC guidance and Virginia Department of Health guidance saying, hey, uh, we need to keep everybody spread apart. We can, we're safer at home is the mantra from the state government, is that what we've done in this COVID environment in our EOC has basically gone to complete virtual operations. So almost every meeting, almost every uh, 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 presentation is done virtually online. We have very little, very few personnel in the EOC through the duration of this event, uh, probably less than eight people here. Now, those eight people are able to see data on the wall. We've continued to use the wall and share data within the, the operations center, but there's only eight of us in here. Everybody else is on uh, conference calls dialing in and things like that because we have to stay socially distanced to maintain you know, the public health. Um, so we're doing a lot of dashboards. Uh, that's been um, a big thing for us, you know, the numbers of COVID cases and things like that. There's lots of data that goes on with the COVID response. And so we're trying to aggregate that data and display it in a way that is easy to understand for our decision makers so that they can make decisions tracking along how we're going to reopen, what the data, what the trending data looks like, you know, flattening the curve and all like that. So there's so much data that's in and around a public health crisis that Cinemassive has really helped us to display that visually uh, for our decision makers when we can, when they can get in here to the, the operations center. During COVID, it's been going on since basically we've had our, our operations center active since February. So February to mid-June, here we are, and we've had a significant uh, thunderstorm that knocked out power to about 30,000 clients in the city of Chesapeake. We've had a hurricane threat uh, we've had um, elections uh, that have had to go on during this COVID uh, environment. And then obviously, very recently, we had a lot of um, the uh, First Amendment uh, displays, uh, the protests. So it has been a real challenge for us to operate in a COVID environment and also do our normal emergency response job um, through this event. And Cinemassive has allowed us especially during the civil uh, protests, we were able to bring in some police guys, uh, display their drone footage, display video footage uh, of the protest, of the walk, uh, bring in uh, social media feeds onto our wall so that they had situational awareness about what's going on during this large 2,000 person uh, protest walk that we had uh, here in mid-June. Uh, and so we had to do that in the COVID environment so we could only have you know, like eight, nine guys in here to do that, but we were able to, with the wall, display that information and share it. Hey, so I'm Bobby Jellemine. I'm senior planner here in emergency management, and I work for Rob Braidwood, who's our coordinator. Uh, so as we look to the future during a, the COVID pandemic, uh, and we look at how we're going to use the EOC, we're very fortunate enough that we have a, a large amount of space here uh, that we can continue to physically distance one another. Um, the way this EOC was designed and the way the Cinemassive system integrates is that we have collaboration tables that are on the outside of the room, so we're able to really space individuals out. Um, we, the fact that we have such a large uh, Cinemassive wall that we can display a large amount of content on that wall, and then that way, so wherever you really are in the room, you'll be able to see what's going on. Uh, the other great thing is that we have several breakout rooms here. Uh, we have uh, our policy room. We have our planning cell. Um, we have our PIO room, our JIC. We can actually take data uh, through Cinemassive and push and pull that content uh, to all these rooms. So that gives us the ability to really kind of space out, but at the same time have great situational awareness of what's going on for any incident. There was a lot of thought that went into the design of this building, and we always you always hear about how uh, an organization wished they had done something. They wish they had gone a little bit bigger. Well, 
we basically took our wish list and made that reality. And we looked at how big that we really need to be, and we went ahead and put that in the, the, the design of this uh, facility. So with, the, uh, with bringing Cinemassive in and using their product and giving us the ability to really um, take things to the next level, and we have that, that opportunity to really share data, to, to use this building to the best of its ability. Thanks, Rob and Bobby. It's really great to see how an active emergency operations center is dealing with converging threats right now. So the next portion of this webinar, we really want to dive into some uh, workflow concepts within Cinenet, which is the user interface layer of the Cinemassive solution. So when you think about uh, emergency operations centers or control room, there's sort of three key components. There's obviously the video wall or the displays themselves. Uh, there's the video wall processor, which in this case would be an Alpha FX processor, which is sort of your rack mounted component um, that's driving and accepting content. And then there's the user interface, which in this case would be Cinenet. Now Cinenet uh, is going to allow us to do a couple things that we want to specifically demonstrate today in terms of overall workflow. So shifting focus within a matter of seconds, being able to observe, orient, decide, and act on information. Um, streaming and interacting with web content, and then sharing content from virtually any device, and then how that starts to play into the global common operating picture and pushing content from your EOC out to uh, regional assets, and even pushing that out into field operations and mobile command. For those of you that are not already familiar with Cinenet, Cinenet is a web-based user interface. So for the purposes of this webinar, I'm just actually accessing Cinenet from my house through Google Chrome over VPN. Uh, the actual UI itself is being hosted either on an Alpha FX core or Elite processor or one of our site manager appliances, depending on the setup for that particular emergency operations center. We're not going to actually cover every feature within Cinenet today. Uh, we're just going to really focus on these five key workflow items. But if you do have more advanced questions or uh, detailed thoughts, please feel free to reach out to sales at cinemassive.com and we can certainly schedule a time to go over some of that information. So let's go ahead and log into Cinenet. I'm going to use my username and password. Click login and immediately I'm going to be greeted with a couple different modes or activities to which I can use for my operation. So specifically, I have a crisis management mode, allows me to quickly activate my EOC. I have emergency operations, which is just kind of general mode for operating during a given event. And then I have a very specific mode of operating that I've created for a weather event. So maybe I respond to a hurricane or a fire. Um, this is gonna allow me to immediately pull up very specific, very relevant content to a regional situation. So I'm just going to click on emergency operations uh, and go into a sort of a general event mode. So as soon as I click on my emergency operations activity, it brings me into the UI. And I'm immediately greeted with a live representation of my video wall. For this webinar, we're using a four wide by two high video wall. Now you notice across the bottom of my screen, I have pre-configured layouts that I've built out based upon events. So these events might be pre canned scenarios, whether they're weather related, traffic related, evacuation related. And if I just click on any one of these layouts, it's gonna repopulate that content built within the layout. So this very quickly just allows me to shift and change focus to a particular situation. I'll click on my emergency alert layout here. Now you notice I have my CAD system here pulled up in the middle. I can still edit these layouts in real time. So if I want to scale that content down, I can. And if I want to bring new content over, I can just click on my assets tab. This is where all my individual sources on the system live. And maybe I want to bring up my wildfire system over here, uh, the JHU COVID map, and this Fox News. So I can use these layouts to pull up any amount of pre-saved content, but I can still edit them in real time as situations and events unfold. 
Now let's go ahead and clear the wall. So let's say you go into a scenario that you've never been in before. Um, there's an event that you're responding to that you just don't have a pre-configured layout for. You can very easily just drag and drop your content up here, populate it as needed. Maybe I need this marriage conference. And what I would do is click Save. And it's going to allow me to name that layout. We'll just call this EOC Webinar. I'll click Save. It's going to give me a notification that that's been added to my Layouts menu. And now if I tab back over to Layouts, I have my EOC webinar. So adding a layout and being able to respond to a situation, whether it's predicted or not, becomes very simple within this UI. So in addition to using layouts, to sort of shift fo focus dynamically during an event, we also have in the system behaviors. So behaviors, if you're familiar with macros, are kind of using the same principle of preset actions that you want to configure under a single button press. So specifically in my behaviors menu, I might want to have a single button press that activates my EOC. Now you notice as I hover my mouse over that button, it gives me a quick description off to the left of what that trigger is going to do. So specifically, Activate EOC is going to turn on all my displays, auto-tune all my cable boxes to maybe national and local news and weather. It's also going to set the EOC lighting if I have lighting integrated and configure my audio system. So maybe I wanted to specifically pull up uh, audio from the weather channel. So instead of having to do that manually and make all these changes in the system, I can just pre-set that button and pre-stage my system very quickly. And operators and admins can actually add these behaviors on the fly. This is not something that has to be specifically coded into the system by a Cinemassive technician. I have another one for local news and national news. So this actually just turns my cable tuners to ABC and Fox Local and then CNN and Fox National, and then it sets the audio. And then I have one for that brings up all my national news. So if I just click on this, it's going to automatically pull up that specific layout that has the content that I want on it, but also on the background of the system, it's going to do my audio rerouting, it's going to change my audio levels, and anything else I need done on the system. And then, of course, I can have a system off button that would shut down my EOC. So post-event, I just want to have a single button press um, that obviously not only shuts off the video wall screens themselves, um, but any additional connected screens, um, sources, DVD players, things of that nature that don't need to be running when there's not an active event. And we can actually take these actions a step further in a kiosk type mode. So what kiosk mode is going to allow me to do is take this behaviors menu and simplify it even further. So I'm going to back out of my emergency operations activity. And now I'm going to go into crisis management. Notice this supports quick activation. And here's why this is uniquely different than my emergency operations activity over here. So once I click on this activity, I'm going into kiosk mode. So I've taken the behaviors menu that I created maybe as the admin or the EOC director and I simplified it for a non-technical, non-trained user. So I could just have a tablet in my EOC running in kiosk mode, so someone that has never been trained can easily walk in and activate the EOC, pull up specific evacuation monitoring content, and even shut the system off safely. So let's back out of crisis management activity for a minute here. And let's say I want something in between crisis management kiosk mode and my full-blown emergency operations mode. What I've created is this weather threat mode. So I'm going to click on this, and it's going to immediately pull up content that I need to respond to, let's say, a hurricane. So I've predetermined what I want to show up when I start that activity, as well as I've trimmed down what layouts I need to see for that activity to respond to the event, and what sources I need to see to respond to that event. Now, just like the other modes, I can still go in here and move content and shift it around as needed based on the event as the, it unfolds. Now one of the cool behaviors I've created in here specifically for this activity is this evacuation monitoring mode. Now notice the description says it's going to auto-tune the weather channel and rotate my traffic cameras. 
So what this is going to allow me to do is on the right side of my wall, I'm going to rotate through varying traffic cameras I have access to for monitoring evacuations. But on the left side of my wall, I can still pull up specific content that I need to for that event. So maybe I want to see this map for a given moment at a time. But then I also need to switch over to the news feed because something's taking place. And I can easily just switch around on my left side of my wall while my right side is slightly more automated. Now you notice some of my sources are actually coming from web-based content. Let's dive into that a little bit more and why that's unique. So traditionally, if we want to bring web-based content up to the video wall, you'd have to do it through an external PC or laptop. So I'm going to grab my PC right to here. And this might just be my laptop or an operator workstation that's out on the EOC floor that's running this web-based uh, GIS map, right? Now, I'm also seeing their Windows taskbar, their time clock, their entire Google Chrome browser, including their bookmarks. Additionally, any Windows update notifications or Teams notifications or Messenger notifications that pop up, I'm going to see mirrored to the video wall. Now, this is inherently a wrong way or a bad way to do it. It's actually extremely flexible, um, but it is tying up valuable desktop real estate for basically um, a static source that could otherwise be hosted through a better method. And you notice I've got a couple icons on, down here that say Cine Agent on them. So Cine Agent is a way we host websites without using an external resource from the client side. Um, so if I want to bring up this same map on the right side of my wall here, I'm actually just going directly to the URL now. I'm not using an external resource to do it. I'm actually hosting this through Cine Agent on the processor itself. And you see this is a much cleaner view. Now, on the desktop version on the left, if I was in front of that PC, I could interact with it, drill down, move that map around. We can actually do that on the Cine Agent. So what I'm going to do is right click that on the video wall. I have a control application option. And this is going to open up the window so I can start moving this map around. If I need to zoom in, zoom out. Or if I want to click on any of these notifications, I could do so. So let's go over here to the left where we saw some, maybe some wildfire notifications. And we can click on these and see what that information is about. And then of course, if we actually close that window out, we would actually see the Cine agent update with that information. So this is a really powerful way to bring in web-based content. Uh, let's use another example, let's say Live Earth. You know, so we can bring up some pretty graphically intensive programs um, without having to tie up other resources. So similar to what I was doing with my GIS map on the right, maybe I want to go into Live Earth. I want to move this globe around, spin that around over to this notification here, these storm warnings. Click on these, drill down into that information. Maybe I want to back out all the way or even switch this map into maybe night mode here because that's going to look better on my video wall. And then that's going to update in real time up to the video wall. And then adding new website, simply clicking this add button in the bottom right. I click add website. I can name it whatever I need to for my event or for my EOC uh, that's going to be familiar to my operators. And then I can just copy and paste that URL right here below. I would save it and then I have access to that. So a really clean and efficient way to get web-based content up to the video wall. So over the course of this webinar, you've noticed that we've got this live stream of the video wall up in CineNet. Now I can click on edit mode to actually turn that stream off. And if I click on live mode, it's going to initiate the streaming engine on the processor itself to begin that live stream. This actually does two things. It will allow me to click this desktop streaming icon if I want to share content into the system. So imagine you walk into your EOC, you're fully active, all the desktop spaces, all the conference rooms are completely filled, but you've got content to share that you need to get up to the video wall. Now, like we said, normally you would just plug into the system, maybe via HDMI 
or some sort of DVI port, some sort of physical sharing device, what we can do with this desktop streaming icon is if I log it into Cinenet, I could start a session, name it, so I'll name mine Dustin Laptop. I would add desktop streaming asset. This is going to allow me to choose what screen from my device, from my laptop I want to share, or a specific application window. So if I've got an Excel document, or a financial briefing, or some sort of ONI that I want to share, I could do so. I'm just going to share screen one because this has a very basic PowerPoint on it. And you'll notice on my Assets Toolbar, I now have Dustin Laptop. And I can just drag and drop this up to my video wall and place this up there so I can see my PowerPoint. Now, this is really powerful for in the room, inside the EOC, but now we kind of delve into global operations a little bit. Now, since Cinenet is a web-based UI, you could bring this up over VLAN from inside or outside of the building and actually be able to share content to the EOC, to any screens that are connected in the system without actually having to physically be present in the room. So Streaming Engine is really going to open up that global common operating picture concept and let's dive into that some more too as well. I'm going to tab over to this high-level workflow example real quick to start demonstrating the global common operating picture within a single site. Um, so for this example, imagine you have one physical building uh, you know, with a larger square footage and it's housing your 911 dispatch center and your emergency operations within the same physical space. Um, so they each have their own video wall um, and then maybe we've got a joint operations conference room or a jock conference room, um, sort of a war room type space that is shared depending on events. Um, this can all be driven off the same processor. So I don't need to have one processor um, per video wall or per display, I could actually send content out to multiple video walls, multiple displays from this system. Um, and what this is going to allow me to do is start sharing resources as events scale up. Um, so typically on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe EOC really only needs content that they're generating locally within their space. Same thing with 911 dispatch. They only need content that's genera genera being generated locally within that room. Um, primarily probably, you know, their CAD information system, maybe a couple of news channels, things like that. Um, but during a larger event, um, you know, obviously there's been plenty of those in the news lately. Um, these need systems need to scale up and EOC might need to start pulling in information from 911 call center vice versa um, the 911 dispatch center might need to have updates coming from the EOC so since this is all being funneled into the same processor um, I could actually push this out between those spaces um, and then jointly if they need to meet in physical space in real time uh, they could use this conference room and even though this is not they don't have a video wall in there per se um, they'd be able to put up video wall type content uh, so if they want to do a quad view of, you know, some of this EOC content, some of this 911 content, they would easily be able to do so. Um, and then obviously they can have shared common sources as well. So, you know, if they have DirecTV or Comcast or something like that, uh, they would be able to pull that information in there and jointly share that across one system and have a local global common operating picture within the room. So these teams start working together more often as events scale up. So in the last example of the global common operating picture, um, we were assuming that both departments, 911 and EOC, were within the same physical building. Uh, but more often than not, we know that's probably generally not going to be the case uh, because you know maybe the emergency operations center and 911 were built at different times, uh, depending on how you know the funding was released for those particular projects. So in this example here. Uh, we've got 911 dispatch over here. It's got its own separate Alpha FX processor. Um, and then down below, we've got the Emergency Operations Center and its own separate Alpha FX processor as well. Um, so two completely separated systems that can operate within their own uh, confines, their own physical spaces, um, but you know they're obviously separated by distance. Now, obviously, EOC is going to have its own content. 911 is going to have its own content. Um, but through the county or city network, we can actually bridge these systems together so they can start working together once again, once events start scaling up. Um, so within my EOC, if I need to pull content from 911, 
I can do so across the network between systems and vice versa. If I'm the EOC and 911 needs to pull content, they can do so. Now what's really cool when we start talking about the uh, global common operating picture at the city and county level is, okay, well, what about city hall? What about traffic management? What about these other services that need to be involved with events as they scale up? There's no reason we can't use that existing network infrastructure to start sending content out to, let's say, city hall. This might just be a display that was already in place. Um, all we have to do is just put a Cinelink decoder behind there this could be an autonomous experience for that city hall uh, organization or that room where it's 911 or EOC just deciding what is getting pushed to that display. What information is pertinent that I need these city hall officials to see during an event um, and vice versa. We still have the Cinenet user interface. So while a majority of this interface is being used for the control aspect, um, it could also be used for viewing and inputting content, you know, so we have this Cinenet user interface down here. This could be a satellite user. This could be someone who's connected over VPN that is viewing what's happening on this video wall or viewing what's happening on this video wall over here. Additionally, they could be actually be pushing content from their laptop at home to an event and start working in tandem with these organizations as these events scale up. Um, so there's a lot of avenues there once we start scaling up and talking about things just even at the city and county level um, and not even really going to a national level, um, which is a whole nother topic. So these last two examples are really great, assuming that you have permanent homes for uh, these varying departments. Um, now let's go ahead and explore the global common operating picture. Um, and a mobile type application. So maybe I have a permanent EOC that has its own dedicated building up here with its own video wall, its own sources, its own FX video wall processor. Um, but then I have a mobile component and that mobile component could be um, a, a mobile command center. Uh, maybe it's just a field operation, a tent type application. Um, obviously, you know, maybe FEMA's coming in and they need to share resources uh, with the EOC. Now, a really great way to do that is with an Alpha FX Strike video wall processor. So uh, we developed this with DoD Command. Uh, essentially, it's a Pelican case style processor um, that you could just easily open up, set up in like 10 minutes. And using something like, um, you know, if you had dedicated internet connection at your mobile command vehicle, or if you had access to, let's say, FirstNet or the Verizon First Responder Network, um, now you have unlimited bandwidth, you could use that over VPN to have these two systems talk. So maybe this is my mobile command center down here. I've got my own resources, workstation, laptops in my mobile vehicle. I'm feeding them into my strike. I'm using the same Cinenet user interface, um, and I've got local displays here. Now what this is gonna allow me to do as uh, from the EOC, the mobile command vehicle could pull down content from the EOC that they need to see. Um, additionally, you could make it more autonomous where uh, the EOC could push content over here deciding, hey, this is the pertinent information that you need to see. And additionally, if they've got resources out at the mobile command vehicle uh, that they need to share with the EOC or 911 dispatch, whatever it is, um, they could decide to push that over to the permanent location up here, uh, vice versa, or the permanent location could decide to just pull that information, um, you know, as they deem necessary. Obviously, they're probably in communication over radios and phone any, anyways. Um, but this is these are really three solid examples of how we can create the global common operating picture and how these teams start working together. Uh, more and more, we're definitely seeing that um, in the larger metro cities. And to some degree, we're seeing this um, in rural spaces as well um, that don't have the immediate dedicated resources uh, to have, you know, a permanent EOC and permanent 911 PD type facilities. And I'm just going to tab over real quick. Um, so this is the Alpha FX Strike. So I just briefly kind of talked about that mobile command and control type solution, uh, something that you could set up in a matter of minutes. This is what that application looks like. Um, this is the FX Strike processor. This all fits into um, a self-enclosed Pelican case. So you can just simply set this up, deploy it in a matter of minutes, 
Um, you still have the same UI user interface that you would normally have with a permanent system, but essentially what we did working with uh, DOD Command and groups like JSOC was how can we take all the equipment that would normally go into um, an AV equipment rack in a permanent facility, condense it down to something that someone could basically put in the back of a Humvee or a patrol car or a mobile command center um, and easily deploy and you know work as a standalone unit or be integrated into the larger global common operating picture and start working with you know a permanent EOC or permanent TOC type application. Um, and normally where you would find this, um, at least within public safety, is if you have something like this, that's a mobile command operations center. Um, we've seen these on various sizes. Um, they come deployed with communication systems already to talk to existing networks. Um, something like this with a strike unit in it, you could easily put that Pelican case strike kit in this unit um, in the mobile command center, have it set up, deployed, and use the existing communication system here to talk back to your permanent EOC. Um, so that way, groups out in the field can see what's happening in the permanent location and vice versa. If you have information in the field, you would be able to push that back to the permanent EOC. Um, so these are some really great examples of the global common operating picture um, through Cinenet, through the Cinemassive processors. Um, it's definitely something that we are really excited about. And if you want to learn more, uh, certainly reach out to sales at cinemassive.com. Definitely be happy to you know, set up a time to talk and review these type of applications, find what the best fit is. Um, obviously, just kind of reviewing those various workflows. You know, it's not always a one size fits all type solution. Um, we realize that everything is somewhat uh, custom to your organization. And that's one of the things that we do is, you know, we certainly scale for that. Um, you know, we can look at a day one requirement, day two requirement, day three requirement, and how those systems need to evolve over time. Um, we take a lot of development feedback from our existing clients and pull that into Cinenet and the larger application. Um, so when a group like, a, you know, let's say a Fortune 500 Network Operations Security Operations Center comes up with a better way to do something, uh, we develop that into Cinenet, and then that gets released to all our users. That the, uh, benefits public safety and DOD um, and all our clients, and vice versa. You know, if a public safety organization comes up with a way to do something that inherently may benefit a network operation, a security operations center that had never thought of doing something like that or that varying workflow. Um, so we start merging best practices across multiple organizations, multiple departments, um, and certainly multiple verticals as well. So I'll end on that note there, and I definitely appreciate everyone's time joining this webinar. Um, I think we're going to open up to Q&A now, so let's go ahead and get that started. Great. Thanks, Dustin. That was a wonderful overview of the capabilities of our software and hardware. If anyone is interested in seeing an interactive demo specifically for your organization, go ahead and email us at sales at cinemassive.com, and we'll be happy to schedule some time with you. Again, that's sales at cinemassive.com. Now let's go ahead and move on to the question and answer portion. Dustin Bilthouse, along with Kevin Quinn on our project engineering team, are online to answer your questions. So give me just a moment here, and we'll begin pulling some up of what you guys have submitted in the corner. Continue to keep asking questions, and we'll get to them in order. Let's see, here's a good one to get started with here. All right, first up. Can you go into more detail about the capability to remotely access video wall content? Sure. So our interface is accessible uh, via network, whether that's over a LAN or a WAN. Um, obviously, you, you know, we coordinate with IT teams all the time uh, to allow people uh, access to the UI and access to the services that we host on either our, our platform's processors or also uh, our external devices that uh, can add redundancy to our processors. Uh, you can log in from uh, you know anywhere on a network um, that has access and uh, allows you to to get to the alpha itself. All right, moving on. What is the minimum number of video streams that the software hardware can manage? And what is the minimum number that comes with the smallest box? Dustin, do you want me to take this one? Uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Sure. Our smallest processor is a uh, four input, four output. Uh, processor from a, from a hardware standpoint. Uh, we also ingest uh, 
IP streams natively into the box. Um, so you can get 16 of those into our smallest processor at the edge. Uh, and you have the availability of up to 16 HD outputs in that processor itself. All right, terrific. Moving on. So we've got here. What training or certification is provided to use the system? Awesome. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question. So, um, I mean, what you saw in the demo, I mean, that is sort of a training light version. Um, but with uh, any installation that Cinemassive performs, we actually do on-site training, which um, for a smaller type operation could be anywhere from four hours, um, whereas a larger operation, uh, maybe you're supporting a 100 uh, operator room, you might want to have maybe um, two sessions across two days. And then we can obviously do more in-depth uh, field certification. So if you want someone to be sort of the tier one technical support within the EOC itself, um, we're happy to do that level of training, which is a three-day course. All right. And our next question here. Let me see here. Can you pull up uh, URLs with authentication information required? Uh, yep, this is Dustin again. I'll take that real quick. So um, just using Live Earth as an example, um, there are certain websites that we realize would require a login. Um, so you have the ability to pin various URLs uh, within this interface, and that would allow you to have that login in there. Um, so you know, if I pull up something like Live Earth or WebEOC or anything else that requires a login, it would be able to um, always be open and active. OK, great. A couple more questions here. Up next, can we integrate the Cinenet software with a pre-existing video wall in our EOC? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So um, you know, on the video wall side of it, um, we can definitely output to just about any video display. So whether that's a video wall or display in a conference room or a set of projectors, um, we can push video from the alpha processor out to any screen um, and essentially um, integrate with an existing video wall and uh, replace, you know, if you have an existing processor or something like that. And then if you have any sort of matrix type system, uh, you could essentially replace that with an alpha FX processor, which is definitely a more robust uh, set of capabilities than your typical AV matrix. Um, or we could look to integrate it as a input output solution along with a matrix. Terrific. Up next, can the FX send a composite stream of the wall canvas? And if so, what protocol is used? Sure, absolutely. So the uh, we have a, a feature called Live Mode, uh, which allows our remote participants and also uh, you know management in the area uh, to view the wall remotely, um, so that they can uh, you know, collaborate with the people in the control room. Uh, and especially in a use case right now, where more people are out of the out of the office and out of the command and control space than in it, um, it allows them to, to basically follow along and also interact with our video wall platform from a remote standpoint. Uh, the protocol right now um, that we're in interacting with and sending out to our remote participants is going to be a lightweight uh, H.264 stream. Terrific. All right. Up next, do I have to install software on my PC? I'll, uh, I'll jump on this one too. So uh, no, you don't. And we, uh, you know, from an organizational standpoint, when when Cinemassive developed uh, Cinenet in the three dot versions. Uh, we were thinking about our enterprise and also our DoD customers in that standpoint. Um, we wanted to make sure that uh, we could work hand in hand with um, with IT teams and not have to, uh, you know, burden them with anything uh, unnecessary that from a from a tower standpoint. So no, you don't have to install any software on the PC. Um, it's actually uh, you're, you're interacting with our browser uh, browser based system. So our UI is all browser based. All right, and up next again, please submit any questions you have in the lower right. We've got a few remaining here. Uh, to what size can your system scale to work with other EOCs and mobile operations? Yeah, uh, this is Dustin once again. So uh, we can scale systems, um, you know, from virtually uh, both sides. Um, just as an example, Kevin mentioned the four input, four output alpha FX edge. Um, so that's a smaller one U UR processor that could, you know, smart, uh, you know, maybe EOC with, you know, six to 10 operators. 
Um, whereas CDS Chesapeake has a much larger processor that is built specifically to their uh, application needs. Um, you know, and obviously that's outfitting an entire 50,000 square foot facility. Um, so it can range depending on the needs of the project and sort of the vision of the client. All right. And let me see our next question up here. What are the most common local and federal agencies you see working in tandem with the EOCs you've worked with? Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, it's, you know, obviously EOC Fire are sort of the uh, owners of the room. And then, you know, inevitably other departments come in as events scale up. So it's not uncommon to have folks from, you know, the police department, sheriff's offices uh, come in and, you know, help and assist and view an operation or an event. Um, and then, you know, on the federal level, obviously FEMA, um, you know, you want to have desk space for them. So, you know, they would be able to walk in, uh, connect to the system, supply additional, you know, visual information to the common operating picture. Um, and groups like U.S. Marshals Office as well um, are, are pretty common at the, at the federal level. All right. Got a couple more coming in here. Uh, let's get over to the next one. Is it integrated with Active Directory for user authentication? So we, we support single sign-on, uh, and we also support um, yeah, so we support single sign-on into the uh, into the actual UI itself. Because um, if your organization has has a need uh, to you know sign on remotely uh, or use one password to go through the organization that is supported. All right, and another one coming up. Can you please elaborate on the transport protocol used to deliver the wall composite? RTSP, transport stream, RTMP, something proprietary? So currently we're using RTSP or RTP over RTSP uh, for our, our wall stream. Okay, let me get a few other questions lined up here. We got some more submissions coming in. All right. Up next, do you have any software or hardware to present content on the video wall wirelessly from devices such as laptops and smartphones? Sure, yeah. Um, so obviously we can integrate with anyone's favorite um, you know, wireless presentation system that's on the market right now. Uh, the processors are, are more than capable of handling those devices and also uh, you know, interacting natively with them. Uh, we also have a feature uh, built into the UI and the processing solution itself, um, and that's called desktop streaming. Uh, so if you have, you know, network access to the to the processing solution, uh, you can present your, you know, desktop or your laptop screen on the on the video wall itself. All right. Another question coming in. How are other com customers budgeting for EOCs and systems like this? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, obviously you want to forecast as much as possible during the planning stages. And, you know, that's going to range depending on where you are with your EOC. So, um, you know, if you're looking to build a public safety operations center from the ground up, obviously that takes a lot more planning and years and years and years. Um, and, you know, as opposed to if you're doing something smaller, maybe lightweight in an existing EOC. Um, so that threshold, you know, for funding is definitely going to depend on what it is you're trying to do and what you want to budget for. But uh, typically most customers that we work with are looking to DHS um, for grant assistance. And additionally, um, you know, the CARES Act has allowed a lot of uh, existing clients and new clients to upgrade facilities. All right, great. We've got one more question left, and let's get some more submissions here. Let me put that last question up. For 125 IP video cameras, how many FX controllers are required? Yep. So um, I can give you an exact calculation, but a 125 IP cameras, let's say if they were all coming in at like HD resolution, 30 frames per second, uh, that could be hosted on a single FX core FX Elite processor. Um, and it's also going to, to, you know, it's kind of a two-part question there. So um, if that is the total number of cameras on your network, um, what we need to uh, engineer a solution for is the number of cameras you want to see simultaneously, um, since we're not pulling in those streams um, when they're not active on the wall. 
And to follow up on that, um, Dustin's got All right, terrific. I believe that's the end of our submitted questions right now, and I don't see any additional ones coming in at the moment. Yep, that looks like it'll be it. So great. Uh, again, thank you to everyone for registering and joining us here today. We appreciate your time. You'll be receiving an email with a link to this recorded presentation. In addition, we would also like to invite everyone to our Real-Time Crime Centers of the Future webinar on August 20th. You can register today or look for an invitation coming to your inbox soon. We hope to see you there and have a great day.